Hello everyone. Imagine a world where surviving a flood is not exclusively dependent on information generated by complex algorithms and satellite data, but by people living in the flood plains reading the shape of clouds and the color and flow of water in the river. A world where the knowledge of generations is passed down through proverbs, music, observations and practices and hold more weight than the predictive authority of complex models. Eight years ago, I was tasked with a seemingly straightforward research project to find out how people living in the floodplains of a transboundary Himalayan river called Gandak in the eastern Indian state of Bihar were surviving annual floods with very limited access to the official flood alert system. What I encountered in those villages strewn, strewn across the floodplain would change my perception of science and would make me rethink a lot about how I would engage with those questions later on. What I encountered was an extremely sophisticated and fine-tuned flood prediction system that involved reading the pulse of the river and gauging the mood of the sky. For example, in the monsoon season in India, which is also the default season of floods, people would look to the sky and would look at the shape and color of the clouds and also their point of origin in the sky. So if the clouds were coming from the southernmost point of the sky, those clouds were not supposed to be rain bearing. But if there was even a light drizzle, that meant there was going to be a heavy downpour. The movements of insects mattered when winged ants got together in large groups and swirled and created clouds almost of their own. That was an indicator for the local population of heavy downpour. Similarly, small red ants moving away from the bank of the river, away from their nest, holding the eggs in their mouth, was also an indicator that the river, the level of water in the river would rise and would perhaps inundate the banks. And it was not just these visual indicators, but there was embodied measurements. At every stretch of the river, people would insert long bamboo poles into the river bank and would make a notch to record the level of water in the river that day during the monsoon season. And in the evenings, when they got together in the village market, people from different stretches of the river would get together and exchange that information and get a sense of how the river was moving. The color of water in the river also mattered. For example, if the sunlight glittered brightly on the surface of the water because it was clear, that means the river was restful. But if the water was a little turbid and the sunlight did not glitter on the surface, that was an indicator that maybe there has been heavy rainfall upstream in Nepal and a lot of matter has washed into the river and there's a possibility that the water in the river would rise. Now, the funny thing is, that this sophisticated system of predicting floods is not owned by agency or individual. It is maintained, archived, and developed collectively by people living in the floodplains. But the tragedy is, this is not considered by as science in India and many other parts of the world. Because this is a system that is not recognized, is very visible in the fact that millions of dollars are poured into very complex flood prediction systems, but not a penny goes into researching and supporting these knowledge traditions. Then I ask myself, what exactly causes this disregard for these kinds of knowledge traditions? And I go back to, the, to my mentor, Dhrubhajati Ghosh, who coined the term cognitive apartheid. What he meant by that was that just like apartheid is a form of maintaining racial supremacy in a society where you valorize one racial group and dehumanize and exploit and marginalize the other, similarly, cognitive apartheid is also built on the valorization of one knowledge tradition over all other knowledge traditions. Now, what do I really mean by that? So if you're going back in time, there was a time when this whole world was teeming with different knowledge traditions. There was China, India, Egypt, Sudan, Japan, the Maya, the Maori, you name it. There were diverse knowledge traditions all across the world. But with Anglo-European colonization and the genocide that happened in North America, and of course also in uh, South America, 
and the colonization of what large parts of the global south, most other knowledge traditions tended to get pushed into the peripheries and the margins. And one knowledge tradition started to dominate the discourse, which is the European knowledge tradition. And this knowledge tradition then would get universalized as science. So basically, when we say science, we mean it's the West, right? We don't even need to use the modifier that is Western science. In fact, I look very funny if I use the term Western science. So science itself became universal, and in that process, it marginalized other knowledge traditions. But here's an interesting fact. In this process of becoming a dominant science, an universal science, it was also absorbing the traditions from other, no uh, the you know, important contributions from other knowledge traditions. So for example, let's look at the foundation of modern science, mathematics. Where does the language of modern mathematics come from if not the Indian Arabic numerical system? Now imagine trying to do maths or computer programming without Indian Arabic numerical systems. And it will be impossible to even imagine how you could put a person on the moon or even be able to access this very talk online later. right? So similarly, the fact is a lot of these contributions are very well hidden, but they're encrypted, encrypted in everyday language of science. Take algorithm, the edifice on which artificial intelligence is built. What is it but a hat tip to Al-Khwarazmi, who basically brought together two different mathematical traditions, the Indian uh, mathematical tradition with that of the Arabic mathematical tradition 1,000 years ago in Baghdad. And in fact, one of his main treaties was called Al-Jabr, from where we get the term algebra. So these are ways by which also we recognize the fact that there is these contributions that hold together this modern edifice of science. But not only that, there's something else that's happening. As this absorption is taking place, there is also the reality of Europe being planted as almost a global history of science. And now I get into an example, which I'm sure is something very contemporary and uh, you'll all relate to, vaccination. Yes, we are getting there. So, we all know the story of Edward Jenner and in 1796 how he managed to go ahead and vaccinate using cowpox pus from one person, so healthy uh, from a person affected, to another person, and in the process, move towards the process of vaccination, which was established all over Europe. But this is a story that all across the world we grew up with, the story of Edward Jenner. But there was also another process called variolation, which was prevalent all over West Asia, Africa, and even China, which was very similar, though of course not exactly the same. And this process was also practice of science by communities. It was people's science. But this history of immunization, a different form of it, is rarely talked about. What we end up with is the European history of Edward Jenner as the seat of all of immunization and vaccination. The reason I bring up this example is, if we were to think of vaccination as people's science, something that so communities and societies have been doing for centuries, maybe the debate around this uh, issue of vaccination would be different. Maybe the reception and engage would be a completely different one. So this is what I want to argue about, that if you were to decenter Europe from your scientific imagination, new possibilities open up. And one such possibility comes from the person on the screen. Does anyone in the audience know who Tu Yu Yu is? Fascinating, because Tu Yu Yu won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2015. She was the first Asian woman to win a Nobel Prize in Medicine. But here's the catch. She doesn't have a degree in Medicine. Neither does she have a PhD from any fancy university. What she is, is, is a practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine, a pharmacologist. In 1969, in China, when there was a serious problem of malaria and Mao Zedong was at the helm of affairs, Tu Yu Yu and her team went into studying ancient Chinese texts and went back 1600 years to look into the reference of Xing Hao or sweet wormwood, a plant that was recorded to be able to cure intermittent fevers. And using the method that was prescribed in that text and modifying it creatively, they were able to synthesize artisiminin, which was used extensively by the World Health Organization in its fight against malaria globally. So the research on traditional Chinese medicine would actually lead to saving millions of lives across the world. But the funny thing is, traditional Chinese medicine is not considered to be science. 
by the medical community, right? So Tu Yu Yu winning the Nobel Prize is a possible hope of restarting or engaging with this conversation of different knowledge traditions talking to each other. Now, while we talk about uh, Tu Yu Yu, there's also another uh, you know, aspect that also opens up in the discussion of science, and that is, what are there other possibilities of this kind of engagement? And I need not tell you that how depressed I was when I was researching about the floodplains in Gandhak River, how the science was disregarded and not engaged with by others. But then I found hope, and I found hope from a far corner of the world, from New Zealand. And I met a remarkable scholar called Daniel Hirokua last year. Daniel is a Maori scholar, and he works on hydrogeology, but he actually brings together Maori knowledge traditions with that of hydrogeology. And in, he, in his research, he talks about, in 2002, the New Zealand government were planning infrastructure around the river basin, and in that planning, they factored in Matauranga, or Maori knowledge traditions, and within that, their own legends. And using those legends, they would identify flood hazard zones and build that infrastructure outside those areas. And the validation came three years later when a flush flash flood happened, and that infrastructure that was built in consultation with Maori knowledge systems ended up being unscathed. So not only that, the government of New Zealand since 2005 has a policy called Vision Matauranga, where, which encourages researchers to engage with Maori knowledge systems. So if you're applying for a research grant in New Zealand, you are supposed to explain how you will engage with Maori knowledge traditions. Now, as I come to the hopeful end of this talk, that plural conversations between different knowledge traditions is possible, I want to say a few things about what I mean by decolonizing science. See, there is no magic reset button that we can press and go back to a pristine pre-colonial past where everybody was living in a land of milk and honey. But the fact is, in many ways, we do decolonize science on an everyday basis. I'll give you an example of this. Just imagine a person who goes, who wakes up in the morning and attends a yoga class, then ends up in office, and most offices have toxic environments these days, so has headache, takes a paracetamol, and then has an appointment in the evening with an acupuncturist because of chronic back pain. Now, first of all, two things to draw out from here. Maybe you should change that job. The second thing is the fact that the person has navigated through three different knowledge traditions in a gap of 12 hours without even thinking about it. Now, if you were to try and break this down theoretically, as to how the flow of qi works, if Western medicine was trying to explain it, it wouldn't work, and Chinese wooden medicine would not be able to explain how Western medicine works. But in practice, we do it. We do it all the time. And we do it, and we know it works, because we can feel it in our bodies and mind, right? So this is an important aspect of decolonizing science, that it is not that difficult. These conversations happen in practice. It is, you know, it's made out to be a big deal. The fact is decolonizing science is not a politics of negativity. It is a celebration of different knowledge traditions that is being asked about. It is not trying to build in a new kind of supremacy over and you know, unsettle another kind of supremacy. When you talk about plurality in science, there is no place for any kind of ethno-nationalist supremacy to enter that debate. What we are asking for is a collective celebration of different knowledge traditions. Thank you so much for your time.